Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. This is Alex, and we have Molly and Eric, and Terry is in the room. Um, and we've got Gia here. Oh, well, Molly's up there, too. Hi, Molly. Um, Molly was a blank space on my screen for um, while she was still doing some other stuff there. Um, uh, we've got Gia here also tonight, and Gia will be telling us about um, uh, the history of astroimaging, and particularly women in astroimaging. So we should have a good time with that. Um, as always, we've got a place over here for you to put all your comments and questions. Be sure to put a little red question mark in there if you can figure out how to do it. A uh, big red question mark if you've got any questions about the history of astroimaging that we want uh, Gia to try to answer. Please put that in there. Um, and, you know, as usual, it's your club. You're welcome to, to, to have your comments and things like that over there. So please enjoy yourself and welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, I want to remind you that we've got some people, interesting people coming up. And I think you were here last week, hopefully. And you heard me whining about that. Well, after Fourth of July, we don't have anybody. In fact, we're doing pretty well. Um, uh, next week, we've got uh, Jasim coming in to tell us about ECOS. I know ECOS is popular with a lot of people because it's a op, it's a system that will manage your computer and your imaging rig and everything else like that and take a night's worth of pictures for you. And uh, uh, Jasim was here earlier, and um, his program is one of the top 20 programs on the Astro Imaging channel. We keep a track of... of which programs gets watched and stuff. And oh, we just thought it was time for an update. Now we've got uh, Curtis coming in the week after that. Rory's going to tell us about how he built his next dome observatory, for those of you who want to see how that works. And we've got other people coming in. We're taking the 4th of July off. It's, that's our Independence Day. And uh, then after that, we've got Ron Brecher coming in. I'm trying to get one of the premier astroimaging guys in here, you know, Adam, Warren, um, Ron, these kinds of guys. I'm trying to get the, one of them in here every month, and so we'll try to do that. And then we're going to have some Mike and Brandon going to come in and tell us about hunting asteroids using amateur equipment. So we've got a lot of things going on for you. If you want to be added to that list, uh, because we need presenters, that's the hardest thing, hit the contact button, tell us who you are, uh, what your email is, and how to get a hold of you. And, of course, one other big announcement I want to make is we're looking for galaxies, particularly gorgeous galaxies, the kind that are up in the spring sky. If you've got a picture of gorgeous galaxies, please bring them uh, to hit this button right here, and your email system will pick up, and you just send us an email to tackshots at gmail.com, and Arno will put them together into a little program for you. And we'll have another program like we had with Neil Wise and Orion time some time ago. So we're really happy that that's all working out. So far, I think we're up to 60 galaxies. And um, that's cool. Now, one thing I can tell you about the galaxies you guys are sending in here. See where it says you need to be about 1,080 pixels on a side? That's to make sure that it doesn't pixelate. If it's too small, by the time we put it into the PowerPoint display, you know, you start seeing the pixels, you, you know, you just, you're over, you're over enlarging it for that. On the other hand, we really don't need 20 megabyte files for this project. A nice, simple JPEG of, you know, three, 4,000 across is more than enough that we're going to need for this project. So don't bother sending us your, your big XISF files or anything like that. Just send us a nice clean copy of a JPEG or a PNG and uh, at least 100, at least 1,080 pixels on a side, maybe as much as two or 3,000, you know, it doesn't matter after that, but we don't need the 20 gigabyte file that you, that you made of that beautiful mosaic of the Virgo galaxy cluster, okay? Just uh, as a reminder. Okay, remember, put all your questions in here uh, and just like put this red question mark if you can. By the way, we'll still answer your questions even if you don't put a red question mark in here. I still haven't figured out how to put it in there. Um, and there's other buttons you can push over here. You can make a donation. We did get a large donation this weekend. We thank you. We're not going to mention any names because we don't know for sure if it was supposed to be a confidential. 
um, anonymous declare, uh, debt donation or not, but we really appreciate that you're helping us fund this. It does cost us some money to get the website and a few other things that we have to pay for this operation. So we do really appreciate it. Um, and you can buy a t-shirt and what's really cool is you can listen to some really good presentations from some really nice people about, well, tonight you can hear about the history of astro imaging. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to turn it over to Gia so that she can start. So Gia, if you go ahead and start your computer up and take over, tell us who you are, what you're doing, and tell us about the history of astro imaging. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I just have some slides about the history of astro imaging. Um, I know Molly, actually, and that's how I'm here this evening. And we're in a group called Stella together. <laughs> Hi, Molly. <laughs> and um, yeah, we wanted to do a post uh, for Women's History Month uh, back in March. Uh, and we wanted to figure out who the first female astrophotographer was. And we realized that none of us knew who that was. So a couple hours of research later, um, I had educated myself on who the first female astrophotographer was, to the best of my knowledge, and just the history of photography in general and the history of astronomy in general and how they're so you know deeply intertwined and i thought it was really interesting so i put together some slides about it and i guess i will get right to them so all right alex can you see my screen um yes it's working over there i happened to be in a different screen at the time you asked that but i got over there and yes everything's going good we can hear you you're not in the you're you're not playing the screen yet you're still now you're playing the screen now you're ready to go. All right, sweet. So here we go. <coughs> so all of this starts uh, in in eight, in the year 1800. Uh, Thomas Wedgwood makes what he calls sun pictures. And he does that by putting object, uh, opaque objects on leather coated with silver nitrate. But the problem with these really early images is that they weren't fixed. Uh, none of the excess silver nitrate was removed uh, from the areas that weren't exposed. So they were ruined almost instantaneously. They didn't have any longevity. Um, <clears throat> 26 years later, in, 19, in 1826, and I, I, have to, I have to apologize to anyone who may be listening from France. I do not speak French, so I'm going to butcher a lot of names this evening. <laughs> um, but Joseph uh, Nieps made the first permanent image uh, where the excess silver nitrate was removed and the image was able to, to, to live a little bit longer. Uh, 11 years after that, in 1837, Louis Daguerre uh, figures out how to make images on, on a copper plate using silver nitrate and mercury as a developer. And this is going to turn into the daguerreotype. And two years later, in 1839, I believe, he patented and released the process for general use uh, for in exchange for a yearly fee. Uh, so at this point, photography is, this is the birth of photography becoming... Uh, available to the general public. Uh, in that same year, uh, John Herschel, who's of course the son of His Majesty of Space, William Herschel, uh, used the term photography for the first time. So even just right in the very, very beginning of photography as a concept, um, astronomy is already there. You know, it's, there's, um, you know, they're, they're, astronomy was there right from the, from the birth of photography, which I think is just super, super fascinating because these, I mean, these are things that, you know, anybody who just picks up an iPhone camera or something and starts snapping pictures doesn't think about the fact that, you know, space is, is what made all of this possible right from the get-go. Um, even today, you know, we're still exploring the connections between the two. You know, we had in 2009, um, Boyle and Smith won a Nobel in physics for their work creating the CCD sensor that we use in digital photography every night when we're out imaging today uh, in this day and age. And of course, you know, that's based off a theory that Albert Einstein won a Nobel for in 1921. Uh, and, you know, he's a theoretical physicist who studies space. It goes all the way back. You know, they're, they're in, invaluable to each other. But um, back, to, back to the time frame uh, here. Let's switch to the next slide. In 1939, <clears throat> uh, Daguerre takes the first unsuccessful image of the moon. Uh, he didn't take into account the fact that the moon does move across the night sky. So 
when he made the exposure, the moon kind of blurred and streaked across the image and he, he didn't get any kind of detail out of it. But it only took another year uh, in 1940 for John William Draper to get the first successful uh, image of the moon. And he did it with just a 130 millimeter reflector telescope, just like you or I could go grab from OPT, um, which is definitely just super motivating. Um, so uh, throughout the rest of this kind of this time frame around 1842 to 1852, uh, multiple daguerreotypes of the sun and the moon are taken all over the world, uh, you know, in France, California, uh, Boston, uh, just, just kind of everywhere. It's really starting to spread. But uh, there's one image of the sun that was taken in Paris, uh, and this image still exists in its physical form today, and that's the image you see there on the left, the daguerreotype of the sun. Uh, and the around the same kind of time period in 19, or excuse me, I keep saying 19, uh, in 1850, the first photograph of a star that isn't our own sun was taken by John Adams Whipple and William Crinch Bond in Boston, and it was the star uh, Vega. So, I mean, they really, really, with the invention of photography, hit the ground running um, with uh, photography. So moving forward in time a little bit, we get to, um, Juan de la Rue, who in, in, in his lifetime was an extremely busy guy, uh, according to everything that I was able to, to find about him. Um, he started capturing uh, wet plate collodion images of the moon and the sun, and that was kind of the original method of, of capturing images the, with silver nitrate and mercury. So uh, using that process, he began to try and capture planetary images of Jupiter and Saturn, and he tried to take a couple images of a comet. And it kind of it kind of didn't really turn out super great. And another astronomer would get an image of the comet uh, in that same year, but it was still going to be a while uh, before anybody was going to successfully capture any planetary images. But uh, like I said, he's nothing if not busy. He captured a very casual 2,778 photographs in the sun uh, between 1952, or excuse me, 1853 and 1872, which, you know, is, is massive. This is not digital photography or anything like that. You know, he's to the, just the sheer amount of money that materials must have cost back then to, uh, to, to get that volume of images is absolutely crazy to think about. In 1861, uh, James Clerk Maxwell actually worked out a system that we still use today with monocams. He had figured out that he could create grayscale images using red, green, and blue filters, the same way that we do today with, with our monocams and filter wheels. It's the same exact thing. And he figured out that he could create a lot of extra detail in his images by uh, putting putting all of them together in this fashion, <clears throat> and just even still uh, keeping up with that with that progress toward uh, getting us to where we are in the modern age. The first image of the moon that was taken with a camera lens instead of a, a telescope was taken in 1865, and it's uh, it's an image by Lewis Rutherford, and you'll see that image there on the left. In 1871, uh, we saw the first use of a telescope being used in conjunction with an electrical shutter, and this was a refractor telescope as well. So this wasn't a reflector. Telescopes uh, throughout this whole time are, are also, you know, getting more advanced, getting more complicated, getting bigger. More parts are being introduced um, to get uh, images of objects just further and further into space. It's also around now that um, the gelatin dry plate process had also been created and uh, astronomers and imagers would, would start moving away from the wet plates with this new process because it was easier. And then uh, following, following in this new process, we had uh, Henry Draper recording the spectrum of the star Vega 
And this was the first time ever that a star spectrum had been recorded. And it only took him about three years. He started in 1872 uh, capturing the spectrum of Vega. And by 1875, he had photographed the spectra of almost all of the bright stars in our night sky. <clears throat> For me personally, I think this is where it starts to get really exciting. Cause my personal favorite uh, is, is, is imaging nebulae. And um, the first time that this had ever happened, uh, Henry, Henry Draper got an image of the Orion Nebula, and this is how it turned out. And I think for, for working with uh, gelatin dry plates and very, very uh, elementary equipment, you know, I think this has a lot of detail. I mean, you can, you can more or less see, you know, the recognizable shape of the nebula. You can see where the triangulum um, more or less should, should be. So things were really starting to, to pick up speed here. Uh, and this is about when Paul and uh, Prosper Henry were imaging Jupiter and Saturn in Paris. And you can see that image there on the right. Those are images that they captured of Jupiter. And these were going to be the first successful planetary images ever captured. And, you know, keep in mind, we're still in 1885. This isn't, the, this isn't even the, ni uh, the 1900s yet. And... Um, you know, we have images of, you know, these, these space objects that are just, just, uh, it's so hard to, to fathom how far away they are, especially for these people who at the time didn't have all of the modern methods of calculation that we have to, to get really, really accurate readings on how far these things were away, but they were still able to image them. Um, and Paul and Prosper Henry are actually really influential figures in the history of astrophotography as well. Um, they were actually opticians, and they made uh, refracting telescopes and other instruments for observatories, and their claim to fame actually, in addition to creating uh, the first images of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, they were involved in starting the Carte du Ciel project, uh, which is a, a huge uh, undertaking in astronomy, and they also discovered uh, 14 asteroids, which at the time they called the minor planets. So they were really, really industrious and, and contributed a lot to, to the science in their lifetimes. <clears throat> uh, also around this time, we're uh, still in Paris. We have uh, Amadie Moucher, and he hosts the first meeting of the Carte du Ciel project. And the point of that project was the mission was that they were going to catalog and image the entire night sky. This was this was a huge undertaking, and it's actually it's a super super cool project. And we'll get um, a little more into detail on this later when we start to talk more about the first female astrophotographer. Uh, also relevant, actually, to what we'll be talking about later is uh, that Isaac Roberts in 1885, uh, between then and around, you know, the end of the century, Roberts was working on a series of photographs to document all 52 Herschel areas of nebulosity. <clears throat> so these are, these are really, really huge product, projects that are happening now to, to catalog space, and these are, these are seriously heavy lifts. Uh, the you know people are people are committing to decades and tons and tons of money and tons and tons of time and science uh, to furthering our knowledge about the world outside of Earth. Uh, and then in 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 this last decade, is really when astronomers begin to start capturing uh, nebulae. James Keeler uh, begins creating a catalog of nebulae in, in California at the Lick Observatory, and. Um, and it's um, we're we're getting better and better images of of planets and of uh, star clusters as well. We're starting to pick up uh, momentum in in study at this point in time as well. In addition, Julius Shiner actually also recorded the spectrum of the Andromeda Galaxy to prove that it was made up of individual stars, which at the time was completely mind blowing to uh, to everybody in in the in the science and the academic world. So uh, right about now, at the at the turn of the the twentieth century, is kind of when more recognizable names uh, start to enter uh, the game, and uh, you know, 
this is when a lot of the guys that have uh, telescopes named after them, a lot of the people who have, um, you know, whole buildings at NASA complexes named after them, you know, this is kind of when they started really making a name for themselves. So, um, Keep in mind, you know, we're we're still we're still, you know, freezers hadn't been invented yet. The Ottoman Empire was still on the face of the earth when all of this was happening. And um, then, you know, around 1924-ish, you know, Edwin Hubble uh, enters enters the scene and starts identifying CFID variables in the Andromeda galaxy so that he can estimate its its distance from Earth. Mind you, um, you know, he estimated its distance to be about 800,000 light years away from Earth. And uh, obviously he was a little bit off since it's a little closer to 2.5 million uh, light years away from Earth. But this is the beginning of the process that we still use today uh, being refined to de uh, determine the distance of, of neighboring space objects. In 1929, uh, Hubble started uh, working on the process that was going to eventually turn into his namesake law and he used photographs of the spectra of assorted space objects to figure out that the degree of redshift seen in galaxies increases in direct relationship to their distance from the Milky Way. And, um, you know, this of course comes to serve as evidence that the universe is expanding. And again, you know, it's still, it's 1929. Um, you know, there's no, there's no TV, there's no digital photography, you know, this stuff is, this stuff is absolutely, you know, science at this point is moving at a completely neck-breaking speed. <clears throat> so a little bit later in his career, in around 1948, he used the Hale telescope for the first time. And in that same year, uh, work on the Palomar Observatory, Observatory Sky Survey uh, started and went until about 1958. And the work that they did there was done with blue sensitive and red sensitive photographic plates. And they were using um, Kodak film, you know, Kodak uh, color processes to do this. Uh, the same as, you know, film that you would be able to go to Walgreens and still pick up today. <clears throat> and this was, you know, and these were used in, in the cutting edge of science. Um, around this time as well, we also saw in 1969, uh, we had uh, Boyle and Smith uh, working on what I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, the CCD sensor that we, you know, we still use in photography today. You know, this gave birth to digital photography and uh, this is this is you know as early as as early as the uh, 70s <clears throat> so uh, after this of course um, you know this this change you know photography and astronomy uh, were we're going to be forever intertwined from this point forward and this was going to open up a lot of doors for astronomers to get further and further into space and to get more and more and more images and process them faster and find um, find a lot more uh, objects that we just had never seen before just because the you know we were we were starting to develop the sensitivity that we were going to need to to find these things <clears throat> and you know from here forward uh, you know this is all it's it's not quite history yet you know we're still making it um, but uh, I want to jump back in our timeline a little bit, because as I, I mentioned before with the Cartagena Seal project, um, there, you know, I want to jump back to the first female astrophotographer that we were, that we were able to find um, is this woman right here, uh, Dorothea Klumpke Roberts. And she was born in San Francisco in 1861. Her father was a German immigrant. Uh, his name was John Gerard Klumpke, and he went to California actually for the gold rush, but ended up becoming a very successful realtor in San Francisco instead. Uh, he married Dorothea's mother, also named uh, Dorothea, <clears throat> which, and that's a painting of her there on the right. 
And uh, they had seven children together. They had five girls and two boys. And um, actually all of the girls, all five of the girls uh, in her family, all of her sisters all went on to uh, have very distinguished careers. Um, <clears throat> and all of them were sent to school in uh, Europe. So her four sisters actually, uh, one of them was a painter, one of them was a violinist and composer, another was a very accomplished pianist. Uh, one was a neurologist who, you know, wrote tons and tons of papers with her physician husband and, you know, left a, a real impact on the, on the field of medicine. Uh, so while Dorothea was in uh, France, she went to the University of Paris and actually originally studied music uh, before she switched to astronomy, um, finding I'm sure that it was significantly more interesting. Uh, from there, she earned her bachelor's degree in 1886 and her PhD in 1893. And she was the first woman uh, to, according to documentation, the first woman to have earned an advanced degree in astronomy. <clears throat> So uh, after she had uh, earned her uh, degree initially in 1887, she started working in the Paris Observatory. And while she was here, she worked with uh, Guillaume Bijordan, who uh, is noted for having discovered around 500 new objects. And he additionally is also known for having created the Bijordan method for adjusting equatorial mount telescopes. Uh, she also worked with Lipo Schulhoff, and he is responsible for having calculated the orbits of many, many asteroids and comets. And she also worked with Paul and uh, Prosper Henry while they were in Paris, um, capturing their images of Jupiter and Saturn. So, you know, there was there was overlap with some in her career, even from a very, very early point in it, uh, with some seriously heavy hitters in the field of astronomy. <laughs> Uh, while she was there, uh, before she, she kind of moved on up through the ranks a little bit, she measured star positions and she processed astro, uh, astrographs and she studied other stellar spectra and meteorites to, um, to, to work on uh, cataloging and publishing uh, reports about, um, you know, the current affairs of space. So this is kind of where her career really starts to tie in with some of the major landmarks in astro, astrophotography that I was uh, speaking about earlier. Um, in around 1886, Sir David Gill pro uh, proposed creating an atlas of the heavens. Uh, the idea got a ton of support by Amadi Mouché, uh, who, as I mentioned before, was uh, the director of the Paris Observatory where Klumke had taken up um, residence. And um, she... Uh, actually, one of the other people she worked with, uh, Guillaume Bijordan, uh, married one of Moucher's daughters. So apparently uh, the world of astronomy was, was still quite small at that point in time. Uh, but Moucher suggested having uh, this meeting in Paris, which would lead to the Carte du Ciel project, which translates from French to Map of the Sky. So, you know, this project is important just because the the mission was to catalog and map the positions of millions and millions of stars as faint as the 14th magnitude, um, about 18 observatories. I was able to, I found a little bit of conflicting information about this actually. So I have some places, uh, some sources said 18, some said 20, but you know, something, something in that general ballpark, um, number of observatories from around the world participated in exposing and measuring more than 22,000 glass photographic plates uh, over several decades, <clears throat> and uh, uh, as part of their contribution, the Paris Observatory was that Klumke was working at was going to do a major, major piece of it. Um, Klumke, at the time, uh, worked her way up to becoming the director of the Bureau of Measurements at the Paris Observatory during the project, and unfortunately, um, the project was never completed, uh, just in part due to the sheer, just how, how much of a massive undertaking it was going to be, but obviously not knowing at the time that they would never finish it. You know, this was a huge, a huge effort of cooperation uh, all across the world that, you know, showcased a real commitment to using photography to document and study the night sky. 
uh, yes. So a little bit later on, she sailed to Norway to observe a solar eclipse. Uh, according to records, there were clouds, so she wouldn't actually see the eclipse, but she did meet the man that she would go on to marry, who we mentioned earlier as well, Dr. Isaac Roberts. Um, he was a Welsh entrepreneur who turned amateur astronomer and at that time had really started to become a pioneer in astrophotography. Uh, he attended that initial meeting uh, requested by Moshe to uh, determine what exactly they were going to do uh, at, with the Carte du Ciel project. Uh, in his own private observatory, he worked with a 500 millimeter reflector and camera and a 130 millimeter Cook refractor, which for a private collection uh, around this time was extremely impressive. Um, so they were married in 1901 and they went to live at his estate in Sussex in England. So of course this means um, that uh, Dorothea left her job at the Paris Observatory um, and she now began assisting him in his project to photograph all of the 52 Herschel areas of nebulosity. So these are huge, huge landmarks in the history of Astro that she had a really significant role in contributing to the creation of. Uh, unfortunately, only after three years of having been married in 1904, uh, Isaac died and Dorothea inherited all of his astronomical uh, equipment and a relatively considerable fortune to continue uh, the project that they have been working on. So uh, she stayed in England after his passing and um, continued to photograph all 52 areas. And after she had completed, she went to go stay with her mother and her sister, the one that was a painter uh, in France at Chateau Rosa Bonheur. And um, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with the fine art world, but uh, Rosa Bonheur was a, a, a very well-respected uh, French painter. And uh, this was, her sister was gay and this was her, uh, her sister's partner's uh, estate that she went to go stay at. So after she had uh, taken, taken up a vacation there, she returned to the Paris Observatory and she took all of the photographic plates that she had exposed with her and she spent about 25 years uh, processing all of the plates and um, appending Isaac's notes uh, to them. Uh, she published multiple papers on the results, and in 1929, she actually published the full catalog called the Isaac Roberts Atlas of 52 Regions, A Guide to William Herschel's Fields of Nebulosity, uh, and that was an award-winning publication uh, from the French Academy of Sciences. Uh, she passed away in 1942 at the age of 81, uh, which I feel like personally for this particular um, time in history is extremely impressive. Um, but uh, she passed away at the age of 81 after having spent her entire life making serious advances in the field of astronomy and astrophotography. Um, she left a considerable donation uh, to the French Astronomical Society, and with that donation, uh, they established the pre Dorothea Klumke Isaac Roberts uh, for the encouragement of the study of the wide and diffuse nebulae of William Herschel, the obscure objects of Barnard, or the cosmic clouds of R.P. Hagen uh, prize. And uh, this is a biennial prize. The first one was given out in 1931, and it is still given out uh, today. They have continued uh, with the with the tradition and uh, her her impact on on uh, astroimaging has, has been extremely significant and extremely lasting. Um, I didn't know if anybody would want to know any more about uh, any, of the, any of the information that I presented in the slides today, so I wanted to uh, just quickly show you the sources that I used to um, collect this information. Um, this first link, the astrosurf.com, uh, is, is a really fantastic resource for anybody interested in learning more about the history of astroimaging. Um, it's extremely thorough. There are a ton of um, images to um, see kind of, you know, what 
uh, what the results that people were getting at, at different uh, timeline at different points in time were. Uh, and of course, uh, the Wikipedia was where I found uh, Dorothea Klumke's uh, biography. And um, the the other two uh, references on here, the Musée de la Photographie.com and the PhysAstro.Sonoma.edu um, links are really great because they provide a lot more information about the actual hardware uh, that people were using throughout history and um, the observatories that were being created and the telescopes that were in them. And uh, I, because I, I didn't, I didn't touch so much on that. I preferred to cover uh, the people and what they were up to, as a, uh, as a, as opposed to their equipment. But if uh, that's something that really interests anyone, those are two links that would be really good for you to check out. Uh, there is also a book, a, a print book uh, called Catchers of the Light about the history of astrophotography. Uh, that's also a really great reference. It's really in depth. It's very, um, it, you know, it covers everything all the way from the beginning and comes, uh, comes pretty close to where we are now, uh, if anybody is interested in checking that out. And then, of course, these are just uh, the sources for all of the images in the slides. So that is my, my presentation for the evening, and thank you guys for listening. Gia, there's some uh, discussion about how bright the stars would have been way back then in Paris. you have any idea? Did you run across any information? So I didn't run across any information, but I'm actually really excited that somebody asked that question because while I was doing all of um, while I was doing all of this research, you know, those questions were kind of crossing my mind too. You know, light pollution is such a huge part of astro imaging in this day and age, and that wasn't really something that they ever had to think about uh, back then. So figuring out what the difference between a 14th magnitude star for them was versus what a 14th magnitude star is today for us uh, is something that I I would really be super interested in learning more about, but um, unfortunately, no, I wasn't, I was unable to figure out uh, the effects of light pollution and I guess kind of the magnitude of, of light pollution that they would have been dealing with at the time, because I imagine, you know, especially around the turn of the turn of the 20th century with the industrial revolution, I imagine smog was becoming uh, an issue uh, as well as, um, you know, artificial lighting becoming more and more and more readily available throughout this whole time period. Was the observatory right in the central part of Paris, or was it on the outskirts? Uh, I'm not exactly familiar with the with the where the observatory is geographically located. Uh, everything that I read about it led me to believe that it was in it, it was in what was Paris at the time. Obviously, Paris has expanded a lot as it's modernized, and the city is significantly larger than it was. Um, in the 1800s, so from from what I understand, at the time, the the observatory was in the in the in urban Paris. There's a question from Guillermo on um, when so that that uh that first picture of the Orion Nebula was that about the time that the mechanical shutter was. Or, or I guess electrical shutter was um, first used, or or is that later? Do you know? Uh, so the electrical shutter was in around 1971. So the image of the Orion Nebula would have been captured in 1880. That's about uh, 10 years later. So it's possible that this image could have been that could have been captured using an electrical shutter. Although I don't imagine it was, given that when capturing uh, nebula, you usually are going to have to work with that longer exposure time uh, to to be able to get any kind of detail. Um, and the electrical shutter was used initially by by that uh, astronomer at, at a more traditional uh, photographic interval. I, b I believe the electrical shutter was used so that he could reach uh, one six hundredth of a second of an exposure uh, to take an image of the sun. So I'm not sure that a shutter would have been used in this uh, for this particular image. Yeah, I'm excuse me, an electrical agree. shutter would have been used for, for this particular image. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So the, the solar picture was taken without any filters, just by a fast shutter? Yep. No solar filters, uh, wow. just, just a fast shutter. And slow film. Yeah, yeah I, imagine, I imagine very slow film. 
I think maybe if anything, um, you know, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, you know, the, the filters that we would think about today, you know, with the red, green, blue and the, the, the HA and everything. I think if anything, it's possible that, you know, they would have used tinted glass similar to an, what we would use like an ND filter. It's possible, but I, you know, there wouldn't have been any um, infrared or ultraviolet filters or anything like that at the time uh, that would No, but they might have had just a simple uh, lightly silvered filter. What, yeah. Some of the early imaging of the sun, well, Im uh, studying of the sun was done through smoked glass. That is, you, you, you let the flame of a candle emit carbon soot and you would coat a piece of glass with that. It was dangerous. I mean, you shouldn't use your eyes for that for long. And some of those people did suffer from that. A lot of the other stuff was from uh, projection uh, imaging, but that's not the kind of stuff we're talking about here. We're talking about astro imaging, which is usually pretty direct. Yeah, so I mean, I, I imagine that, uh, yes, it would have been either something lightly silvered, it could have, it, it's possible that images could have been taken through smoked glass, it's possible that they could have been taken through, um, you know, like a, 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 t a tinted uh, glass or something like that, but nothing, nothing in the sense that you or I, I think, would call an astro filter would have been used at this point in time. Guillermo has uh, come through with an answer that it was in the Jardin de Luxembourg, uh, which... Uh, thank you. Okay, I don't remember Paris that well, but yeah, that's the Palais de Luxembourg is pretty much close in there. Yeah. So. You know, I've personally never been to Paris, so I am not uh, not super familiar with the, how the city is laid out. I want to go back to Paris. <laughs> I would oh. like to go to Paris for a first I'd like to go any place actually, any place right now. Yeah. Any place. <laughs> yeah, I haven't actually made it to Europe yet. I've been to South America twice and not Europe. <laughs> well, there's a lot less light pollution in South America, Molly. I think that's where oh, yeah. all the interesting stuff to do is going to be anyway. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, bring my astro gear to, to Europe so much, but um, it would be cool to go see, you know, the tourist highlights and whatever. <laughs> uh, Gia, can you tell us what kind of astrophotography you do for yourself? For myself, um, I'm actually super, super, super new. Um, like if you go find me on Instagram or something, there's like nothing there. Uh, personally, I'm super interested in deep space. I'm really interested in, um, in nebulae. I don't really do um, or currently have a ton of interest in uh, solar. I would like at some point uh, further, further down the road to get into planetary. But, uh, but right now I'm really, really interested in I like uh, star clusters. My first astro image, actually, that Molly was instrumental in the processing of, uh, was uh, the Pleiades star cluster, and um, I'm really interested in getting further into photographing nebulas. So you wouldn't have any prejudice for females because you're photographing the Seven Sisters, right? <laughs> no, I just I started in a. Uh, I, I think I'm on the East Coast, so in the summertime. We do not have the clearest skies. It's so humid. And of course, at night, it gets cold and the clouds roll in and everything. So I actually am able to do most of my imaging in the time. And the Seven Sisters are right there, right when you go out. You don't have to wait for them. They're out all night. <laughs> so, uh, Adriana like asked, the, are the, are the 27,000 glass plates uh, still available in some form or another? Uh, the the twenty two thousand glass plates from the twenty two thousand yes. project. Yes, um, I imagine that they should be. Uh, they're extremely historically relevant in the to the to the history of. Um, I do not personally know where they are, but I yes, I would I would I can say with with reasonable confidence that yes, they are preserved. I'm not sure if they're available for public viewing, but I'm yes, I'm I can confidently say that they are preserved. Uh, Gia, could you stop sharing your screen so that I could present something? Absolutely. Thank you. Share now. Um, you've got a number of comments uh, for your um, uh, your list of resources, and uh, 
and I knew that you were going to be providing the list and I, I didn't have time to read through your list, but I wanted to share with everybody. Uh, can you see that right now, uh, the yes. breakthrough? Okay. Um, it's a book by Gabani and, uh, and Rob Gendler, who are two of the premier astro imagers of, um, of late. And they take you through well, 100 astro images, astronomical images to change the world. And they give you a very, very good history of um, important astro images and give you the background of them, why they were important and things like that. So um, anybody who'd like to get into that, go Gendler and Gabani. And, and of course, it's full of those images. It's a full color book. It's a beautiful book. Uh, so I'd, I'd suggest you... If you're interested in the kinds of things Gia was talking about today, and apparently you are because a lot of people complimented you, Gia. Um, Thank you. Check out this book, okay? Yeah, Thank and you, I do. Andrea. I do really recommend the Catchers of the Light book as well. It is it's a really cool book, and it's a really fantastic resource as well. Even just to go to the website, uh, if you have no interest in buying the book, um, you can uh, you can look up a lot of information on there. It's the website is a wealth of images that I've never seen before that are really, really, really cool, really, really old images. I, in addition to astrophotography, I'm also just a fan of regular, you know, old fashioned silver based photography. So it's, it's really cool to see these, to see these images having been preserved that are, you know, 200 years old. Can you direct us to your Instagram page so that everyone can see what you post in the future? Sure. I use Instagram uh, so infrequently because I am. Or, or is there another place that you share <laughs> images? Oh, no, that's the only place that I share images. But uh, All right. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my Instagram handle is G underscore underscore 7635 because the bubble nebula is my favorite nebula. And that is its new general catalog designation is 7635. Oh, I was trying to get that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, oh, that is backwards is what that is. I don't know if it's going to do any good. But yeah, G underscore underscore 7635. It's really backwards for you, um, but I'm going to put the link in the, uh, the chat anyway. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. I appreciate the interest. It's really generous of you guys. <laughs> yeah, the, the people here uh, you know, and, and in this community in general uh, are really supportive and like to keep keep up with what all their friends are posting and see what uh, how you progress and yeah what cool astro images you create. Yeah. Courtesy of Stella, I'm actually uh, working with a, the new Radiant Raptor. The T-ring wow. and the bat knob mask are in the mail. So there will be something on Instagram page soon. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited to see how that scope performs. It, it, they, they're advertising the heck out of it. So. Oh, absolutely. Oh, God. Yeah, so when you, when you we're get getting into uh, nebula season. So what's on your hit list? Yeah. I don't know. Honestly, uh, my main goal for this summer is I would like to um, use uh, my eight millimeter to get a full arch, a full Milky Way arch. Uh, that is that is my absolute main goal. And I'm so jealous, uh, so torn, actually, uh, because I think that everybody in the southern hemisphere, they have the better nebulas. I mean, you guys have the tarantula nebula. That is the coolest thing in the sky. Um, but of course, you know, they don't have a Polaris to polar align. They just kind of have to like aim and pray. So I, I'm not sure if they're lucky well, or if they're unlucky. <laughs> they, they have the tarantula, but at Northern Hemisphere, we have a much wider variety and number of nebulas to photograph. Because yeah, once you get to the large and small Magellanic clouds, that's about it. Yeah. No offense, Terry, if you're listening. <clears throat> Yeah. I ain't listening. <laughs> so like like uh like the um like the twenties uh latitude south uh is a is a good spot because you have the core of the Milky Way overhead, but yeah. you still have enough northern sky to get a good majority of the northern targets and enough southern sky to be able to see the Magellanic clouds pretty yeah. nicely. Uh, so the um, uh, where I went to the Atacama Desert in 2019, we had just kind of the, the perfect amount of stuff. And I was at 27 latitude. And, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 
Because then the Atacama is famously dark. So I imagine yeah. just being able to just completely separate from imaging, just being able to be in that kind of environment where you can see so much, I'm sure was just very otherworldly. Yeah, while the camera was running, we were running around looking through Dobsonians and uh, doing all kinds <clears throat> of field observing as well. And that was, uh, it was, it was phenomenal. Well, well, in the Southern Hemisphere, a dark place, you can walk out when the Milky Way is overhead, probably around August, July. It will cast a shadow. Oh my gosh, that's incredible! So it's uh, yeah. nothing in the north compares with that. <laughs> no, not at all. If no. you uh, if you look at a light pollution map of the United States, there's a pretty clean line right down the middle of it, where like everything is like Bortle yeah. like nine, and then everything on the other side is like Bortle three. And I live on the Bortle nine side. <laughs> so. But I will say, what we lack in dark skies, we make up for in a lack of animals that are trying to eat us all night. We don't have oh, yes, lions. You agree. We don't have you bears. agree. <laughs> Nothing with large teeth. We don't have scorpions. We don't have venomous snakes. It's Every very, week, I see a new Christmas. story on my Google News of, of, an, of a new frightening creature encounter in Australia, and oh God, they're yeah. all terrifying. <laughs> yeah, you're, you have these, these dinner plate spiders. What the heck is up with that? That is so right? uncalled for. Right? Uh, and instead of <laughs> instead of deer, which run away from you, there's kangaroos, which can cause a lot more trouble. <laughs> it's a fun place. Yeah, well, and don't forget spiders. about the uh, the sharks that eat you and the bottle jellyfish, oh, which urchins. sting you. Yeah, and the death. spiders that like coat an entire like park in like spider snow. <laughs> all right, all right. We're, let's not beat up on Terry and us. Okay, anyway. kids. Let's all head on back to the <laughs> astro imaging stuff. Um, <laughs> And by the way, nightfall is coming off as planned. And one important part of nightfall, every time we have nightfall every spring, every fall, fall, nightfall, uh, is we have a scorpion hunt. No. So we got things to bite you here, too. So anyway, um, as an ox says, there's things to see on both sides, up uh, north and south of the equator. So let's, uh, we'll be back to traveling soon. Um, I know most of us are. I hopeful are, are, are. I hope made it through, and we're we've all been vaccinated by now, and we're ready to go. So, um, is there any? Are there any other questions, Eric? Anything else we need to cover? Um, I think we got them. You think we got them? Okay. And uh, next week, the guys from Ecos are going to be okay. here, and they're going to be talking to us about um, some innovations in their program which is um, a real handy way to make a, a particularly a portable rig because it's so light and easy to use. And um, then we've got a lot of other things planned for you. Don't forget to get your gorgeous galaxies in. We need gorgeous galaxies for his pictures. And um, are there anything else, anything else we need to say? Then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna start concluding the evening. Thank you very much for being here. And thanks again, Gia, for telling us about the history of astro imaging and about the women in particular. Thank you. Thank you very bye much bye. for having me. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, stick around, Gia. Uh, don't, don't log off. <laughs>